Hello, this is Name Your Game, a video game podcast brought to you by SharkTank.com. Uh, each episode, we have a new guest with us, so we can talk about their favorite games from the past and present. Uh, so my name's Dane. And I'm Tim. And today we have Ty Taylor, game designer and programmer. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? We're doing pretty well. Yeah, I'm doing fantastic. Just trying to survive this weird heat wave we've got in the Seattle area. Yeah, it's pretty hot here. Yeah, I just got back sure. from Dallas where it was worse. It was 106 when I left. Oh my wow. gosh. Was it, uh, was it less humid there by any chance? Um, no. No, it was hell. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. Anyway, to, to, to get to the topic at ham, uh, the first question we have for all of our guests is, what is your favorite video game of all time? Hmm. That's a tough question, actually. Yeah, yeah. Especially, especially as a game designer, I'm sure. Yeah, so uh, another way to phrase the question would be, what's one of your favorite games that you want to talk about right now? I guess my, my decision, uh, or I guess my answer to that question is both, mostly based on nostalgia, and I would say Ocarina of Time. Nice. I, yeah. You know, plenty of arguments could merit that as a, a worse game, objectively, you know, <laughs> to some modern games with better graphics or sure, sure. more depth. But that's kind of a game that I, I played when I was not, not not so young that I didn't understand it, but, you know, mm-hmm. young enough that it was able to make a, a significant influence in, in the way I, I perceive video games, the way Absolutely. they could, you know, really make you f- make you feel something and make you, you know, it's the first time I, I felt like I actually was the character in a game. Sure, yeah. If that makes sense. The, the first time I was so immersed into a game where it, it, it had such a, such more of a deeper impact to me than any kind of movie or music ever could. Yeah. Because I was actually interacting with the world. And all, I mean, I'm descri- describing plenty of games, but I'm saying Ocarina <laughs> of Time because it's really the first game for me that, that had that kind of impact. Sure. Was it? Were, were you already familiar with the Zelda series? Had you played Link to the Past or the original Zelda? I had. Um, but I guess I, um, with, from like a top down perspective, I guess with like those original games right? or, or the low resolution kind of, of original style, it doesn't mean they're any less fun, but I think, you know, you we were really able to achieve that kind of immersive value with, with that quality of game. For sure. Yeah. Especially because at the time, the N64, the graphics probably... Uh, appeared in such a way that they were a lot better than we can really look at them nowadays. Like back then, it was like our minds were blown exactly. by those graphics. Exactly. Yeah, I, I agree with you, actually. I, I remember, I think I got Ocarina of Time with a Nintendo 64 for Christmas in 1998. Mm-hmm. And I, I was pretty obsessed with it. I remember playing it uh, nonstop for, I think, about two months. Uh, yeah. and, and, and I liked it so much that I was actually maybe more excited for Majora's Mask than I have been for any other video game that I can remember. Like that childlike excitement for a game. I yeah. wish I wish I could tap into even a little bit of that nowadays <laughs> in my adult life. I feel the same way. I don't I don't I mean I'm ex- I guess excited for modern video games, but I don't feel like I'm using the word in the same way as I would have 10 years ago. Sure. Yeah, if that makes any sense. Like, yeah, uh, yeah you know, I'm definitely going to get this game. I'm I'm sure I'm going to like it. I'm sure it's going to, you know, be great or, or, you know, touch me in some way, but it's not nearly the excitement that I once felt. Yeah, absolutely. I know exactly what you mean. And I really think nowadays, too, it kind of takes a very unique or significant change in what the game brings or how it's structured to really bring about that sort of excitement or interest. Like, because I think so many games are being made that are just too similar to one another, uh, it, it yeah, just it, it takes a lot of innovation. You know, for me, like, for instance, as soon as... Uh, there's more support, more games for the Oculus VR, for instance, and, and, and when that's available uh, from a consumer standpoint, I mm-hmm. think that I'm really, really going to be interested. I'm going to be jumping on that train because I love the idea of virtual reality, personally, and to- total immersion. I was thinking the same thing when you brought up, um, you know, the jump from 2D to 3D being, yeah. you know, that that key that was missing for the, the immersion factor that you feel. Mm-hmm. I think that's this generation, or at least this console generation's version of that that leap. The leap from 2D to 3D, and the leap from 3D on a screen to 3D in VR space is is probably very equivalent. Yeah. Have you uh, have either of you guys had a chance to check out like a demo version of an Oculus Rift or anything? I know they had them at PAX. Uh, I didn't, um, unfortunately, wasn't able to <laughs> check it out, but... Uh, I haven't actually used one yet. The line was really long at PAX, and I just... Uh, yeah, that's what I kept running into as well. <laughs> I've, had, I've had plenty of demos of a lot of different VR and AR, which is augmented reality, mm-hmm. and they're all 
they, they all blow my mind. Yeah. I've, I've been in a demo with uh, one that you put on your head and has full head and body tracking. So you, as you walk around, you're actually walking around inside the environment. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And uh, I've, I've been on a demo with, uh, uh, how do I describe it? Maybe like a, a two dimensional treadmill. Um, so like sure. you got like this big circle around your waist that doesn't really let you move, but your feet are free to move. And so it's, you can like yeah. run around and interact with environments that yeah. way. I've actually watched uh, uh, some demos of that particular device. Uh, I don't remember what it was called. Uh, I think it started with an started with an O or something like the. I don't remember. I, I've seen uh, someone playing a first-person shooter, holding basically a plastic gun and strapped into that treadmill thing with the mm -hmm. Oculus on, and and it was really fascinating watching them make their movements in sort of the picture-in-picture, picture while also mm -hmm. watching what they were seeing in the game and how it was uh, working together. Yeah, I mean that stuff. I mean, if, if I had the choice, I, I would be jacked into a game, like in the Matrix, yeah. <laughs> in a heartbeat. <laughs> I think it's I called just... Omni. Um, Omni, yes. That sounds about right. Yeah, you know, I actually recently finished reading a novel called Ready Player One, and it's about a future <laughs> where um, basically everyone in the world is jacked into this virtual reality. <laughs> internet, it's basically the internet's all virtual reality, but the way it described... The, the get up is exactly what you're talking about. There's, you know, the, the higher end models have like a treadmill. So you're actually running around mm -hmm. and you got the helmet on and, sure. and gloves. And then, and then it said like the higher end models would do like a full body suit that actually have like small force create, uh, what, what would I call them? Um, basically little, little pads in your, uh, in your suit that would create force so it would feel like you're actually touching things. Nice. And like if you if you get punched in the game, it would feel like you got punched, but like not as hard, you know what I mean? Sure, it wouldn't actually sure. hurt, but you'd feel it. Yeah. Um, and it, honestly, like we're not that far away from that, you know what I mean? No. I mean, we're getting to the point where, where almost anything is going to be possible, uh, just depending on how much money can be dumped into these technologies. Yeah, they're fairly expensive. The Omni itself, I think, was around $400, 450 sure. maybe. Well, and I even just mean from a design standpoint uh, oh, to, yeah. to research things like this, you know, the, the interest has to be there. But uh, that, yeah, that novel, uh, Ready Player One, I've heard of it. I've been meaning to read it because I, I read Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash not too long ago, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I really loved it, and I've, I've heard them paired pretty closely. Ready Player One's more like a, I don't know, it felt like a young adult novel. It's about a teenager, and it's sure. kind of like, it seemed like a little too much of a Mary Sue, and it had way too many 80s references. Oh, uh, <laughs> Because it was like a future where a certain thing happened that made it so 80s culture was cool in the future. So like there were just a ton of 80s references. I was like, this is not made for my generation. This is made for the generation before mine, you know? Sure. Um, hey, I, I like 80s references. I still like the story, <laughs> but it was just it was it was a little too much for me on the 80s references. But anyway, uh, Dan mentioned Majora's Mask or the have you played Majora's Mask time? Yeah, of course. You know, oh, I that was, oh, wow. You need, to, you need to change that. It's yeah. funny. I, I actually didn't realize you hadn't played it, Tim. And, and my, I was about to cut you off and say, what a weird thing to ask someone who enjoys video games in any capacity. Have you played Majora's Mask? But then you just... Uh, hey, kind of I guess I was just sheltered from that in one way or another. I, I don't know how, but yeah, I never played Majora's. I do love Ocarina. I enjoyed it a lot, and yeah. I love Zelda as a franchise. It I just, think you've actually played more Zelda games than I have, I, too. Yeah, I've played quite a few. A lot of the handheld versions um, yeah which other than like minish cap and phantom hourglass were well you know yeah um i i absolutely loved majora's mask i actually attribute majora's mask to the reason why i live up here in the seattle area because i joined a forum to talk to other people about majora's mask when i was uh, just starting high school met a friend on that same forum and we we just started chatting and became best friends and he lived up here and i, I eventually just moved up here because yeah the that's area neat because you can so get nice. married now yeah, he and I can totally just you know <laughs> shack up shack now. Up. Uh, but but anyway, uh, Majora's Mask. How, how do you how did that measure up to Ocarina in your book time? Um, in my book, I don't know. I I it was formatted very differently. I mean, the story was was all there, I suppose. But the gameplay, I felt I felt a lot more rushed in the gameplay for some reason. I felt like in Ocarina of Time, I was able to take my time. But there was a lot of things in Majora's Mask that were timed. Sure. Well, the game itself, almost as a whole, is is being timed. Yeah, I didn't like that. I didn't. I didn't really yeah. feel like that fit as well into a Zelda game. Sure, I liked it. I don't get me wrong. I did like it. But I didn't like it as much as Ocarina of Time. And that was probably the reason for it. For sure, and that makes sense to me, considering the fact that you know the thing that you seem to like the most about Ocarina of Time, the thing that really appealed to you, was being immersed into that world. And part of mm -hmm. being immersed into a world is being able to explore it at your own pace. Uh, right. So that that makes total sense to me that Majora's Mask would mess that up a little bit for you. 
it, it added a lot of stress that I thought was unnecessary. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that in terms of the feel of Majora's Mask, that stress actually kind of fits. And, and you know, it's it, there's like theories and whatnot that Majora's Mask, Link is dead and he's in limbo or whatever because it's so like weird and alternate and everything's so like bizarro. Mm -hmm. So somehow, you know, the fact that you are being timed and, and feeling stressed almost kind of fits that creepy negative vibe that the game has. In some regard, I do see the, the appeal of that. And I think a lot of people do like it for that reason. It almost has a horror aspect to it. Kind of. As, as much to horror as you can get in a Zelda game, I in suppose. In Zelda, yeah. And it's, it's yeah. very different for a Zelda game, too. I think that's another yeah. cool thing about it. It's very offset from the rest. So what about newer Zelda games? Have you played, like, Skyward Sword, uh, you know, Twilight Princess, that kind of stuff? Uh, I played Twilight Princess. I didn't get a chance to play Skyward Sword, unfortunately. That it's okay. Kind of came out. <laughs> yeah, me and, me and Dan are in the same boat. In fact, we, we had fully intended to play it together, and we, we got to, like, the first dungeon. And, and like, just took a break. And, like, all right, let's save, and we'll get back to this tomorrow. <laughs> never. Two years later. <laughs> um, yeah. I actually really regret not playing it, because I just I haven't had the time in the last couple of years, honestly. Like, most of my video game playing experiences or several years ago and in the past sure. uh, couple of years once I started you know, working heavily on the bridge and now Tumblestone it's just I have no free time anymore yeah so I really have to be selective yeah I mean I've never worked on a video game before Tim's never worked on a video game before but I mean I, well, I technically that's not true <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> I've started I've, I've, I've started a game and it went nowhere but that doesn't mean i haven't worked on a game <laughs> oh okay <laughs> i haven't worked on a, a finished game is is the yeah. statement you should have well, said I, uh, we're working on games that uh, uh end up in a retail environment um <laughs> <laughs> i i can only imagine would take especially smaller games where you're not working on them with a very big team i can imagine uh would take a, a very significant amount of time uh, out of yeah. your life uh, uh to kind of coddle them into into being I've certainly put more effort, much more effort into making games than I have anything else in my life, any other job or anything. I can imagine it's really rewarding. Yeah, it Abs absolutely is. It's worth every second. I don't, I don't even call it a job because it's like a hobby I get I get paid for. But, you know, it's certainly yeah. the most uh, certainly the best job I've ever had and the most uh, creatively liberating job that I've ever had. Awesome. That's that's so cool to hear. Um you know, you, you mentioned we working on the bridge. Which is, I've actually recently been playing the bridge, and I, I like it a lot. I love puzzle games like that, so it's really cool. Um, so my question for you is, what were your influences? To me, it seemed like Braid was probably an influence. Um, Absolutely. But uh, what other influences did you have behind that game? Um, my primary influence was actually artwork, the art of MC Escher. Um, okay. I, I would um, look at his, his, his drawings and... Imagine what it would be like to be inside of one. What would it be like to, you know, be inside of this impossible architecture and sure. walk around and explore this world? But, you know, I, I kind of realized that the only way that that could be possible was in a video game. Because um, by definition, his artwork, a lot of it, you can't create in real life. Yeah, for sure. Well, except in the movie Inception. Sure, but that means <laughs> that's, not, that's not you experiencing it. It's you watching someone else experience it. Right, Absolutely. Um, and so that's that going back to the immersion, right? Uh, you actually can feel like you're the player exploring this uh, this world. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely got that feeling from the game. That game makes you think about gravity and everything. Like, I, I, really, really, I really wanted to tell you this story because I thought you'd get a kick out of it. But I've been playing the game for about an hour straight, and I was really immersed in it, you know. And part of the game is that you're turning the world, and, and gravity is being... It's being kind of morphed in a certain way, and you know, especially when you get to like the third world, when you have the I don't know the shimmering parts that have their own unique gravity that you can. Mm -hmm. So I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna take a break. I got up and I picked up my water bottle and I just kind of let it hang loosely, and I spilt water because I forgot <laughs> the gravity. I, I like it, it, for some reason I forgot how gravity works because I played that game and I got so immersed in it and how gravity was just kind of like a an amorphous thing. It wasn't a rule in, in that game. You know what I mean? So I like right. I just got up and I grabbed my water bottle and I was holding it sideways and I spilt water all over the floor. And I was like, that's oh, amazing. Man. <laughs> I'm so happy about that. Yeah, that's really <laughs> cool because obviously and, and we've we've you know mentioned this uh, word a few times, but it's immersion that would cause something like that, you know, to happen to somebody. Uh, and, and given that that seems to be, uh, something that you're a fan of, the fact mm -hmm. that you've clearly made an immersive game is really cool. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, for, for me, I haven't finished it yet, um, but the puzzles were really satisfying as well, so it, it, you know, that combination of being immersive and also 
having puzzles that weren't frustrating and felt good. You know what I mean? That was a, mm-hmm. it was good for me. But um, we talked about uh, what you called your favorite game of all time, which is Ocarina of Time. What's a more recent game that has really blown you away? Really, uh, really impressed you? Oh man. Um... See, see, the trouble with, you know, making games is that I spend all of my time making games and very, very little time playing them. Um, sure. Well, you know, I've, how about last five I years? I don't, I, don't, I don't know if you would call this recent. But I would say Portal 2. OK, that's 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 recent enough. Yeah. Our other guests have said Mass Effect, the first one. OK, yeah, we're, we're pretty we're pretty, pretty loose on how we defined recent. <laughs> Plus, 2007 really only feels like two or three years ago. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. I, I, I don't know. I, I still like one of my go to games is the uh, community levels of Portal 2. I thought I thought that was an outstanding thing for Valve to add to the game because, Absolutely. It, you know, it instantly made thousands of levels that you can play. And, and based on the, uh, you know, the Reddit style of user upvoting or downvoting levels, uh, you find the ones that are actually really, really good, um, arguably better than the ones that shipped in the game. And you can play those and they're just made by, you know, regular people, indie yeah. designers from around the world. Yeah, and plus, I mean, just any any large game that is is moddable mm-hmm. uh, just almost offers a, a place where people, like you said, indie game designers, people who are interested in making games but aren't really ready to start on their own, that's a really sure. awesome place to start. Absolutely. I, I mean, I used to make mods before I started making my own games as well, and it's a great place to start for a designer. Yeah. What, what games did you mod, just out of curiosity? Halo 2, mostly. Okay. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, um, I, I remember the first Halo when that came to PC. Uh, I think it was it was worked on or, or, or done mostly by Gearbox, and and I recall there also being an awesome mod community for the first Halo. Uh, mm-hmm. My friends and I would have LAN parties, and we would get all of uh, the modded levels we could find, and then just try them all out, and then our favorite ones kind of stayed in our rotation. Yeah, and I thought that was awesome, especially taking a game that at the time was sort of bringing shooters back to consoles and and a lot of people were into the console versions and then they took those games and then put them on pc in the most pc way you can get you know with Mm -hmm. with with modding and i thought that was really cool because it was like now i'd have extra little reason to play it on xbox because i was you know really into pc games at the time as well yeah i've always been i've always been a pc guy especially when it comes to shooters and you know speaking of mods back back when i first discovered mods it was when half-life came out you know and half-life was i could be wrong but to me it seems like the most modded game ever <laughs> and there's so many mods that have become standalone games like day of defeat and counter strike and everything like that yeah half oh, yeah. games are known for that yeah, I, I mean, Team Fortress Classic became Team Fortress Two, and they were all free. You know what I mean? And so many felt mm-hmm. like a felt like a new game, and it was always like this cool thing where you can get it for free. And, and because Half Life had such a great engine, it was really it worked really well. But what what kind of mods did you make for Halo Two? Uh, mostly just levels and different like mechanics inside levels. Nice. Okay. Um, out of curiosity, actually, uh, uh, as a game designer, are there any game companies larger game companies that would be like your dream company to work for or or do you just prefer making games for yourself honestly I, my dream company is my own company um okay. i've i used to work for for microsoft studios and it's just a, you know you're just doing a, such a small thing it doesn't matter how awesome the project as a whole is sure. unless you're the creative director or someone at the top one of the like the three or four people at the top your role is, I don't want to say insignificant, but it's not creatively satisfying. Absolutely, I could totally see that. So, uh, we actually got derailed from the question I asked you, but Portal 2, what about that game really impressed you? It's hard to say. The overall design, I think I started playing Portal 2 when I kind of got more of a, a game designer background behind me, and um, I was really appreciative of, of how well it flowed together. I mean, the story was fine. It was, you know, quirky and funny, and I, I enjoyed it. But sure. mostly the, the the puzzle design, uh, the way the way the puzzles make you think, the way the the way the part of your brain works when you're solving a portal puzzle, right? It, you know, it really resonated with me. Very cool. Um, yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I had a I had a blast with Portal Two, and and I really liked how it would kind of go back and forth between sort of test environments and the outside of the test environments where you had to kind of find where to go next in terms of looking kind of around for a white spot on a wall in the distance and then yeah. kind of figuring out how to get up there or to work with the physics to 
the layout of the game was really nice that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I thought the layout was fantastic. Because, uh, you know, Portal, the original Portal for me, going into the game, I had no idea what it was. I'd never heard of it. I kind of went into it, and I beat it in one sitting, and I, my mind was just completely shattered. Like, my whole world was shattered because of this game. <laughs> And so I was so skeptical about what they could do with Portal 2 to make it a, a worthy successor to Portal. But mm-hmm. but just the way they laid the game out where you're like going through this old and destroyed, you know, test facility that's half test facility, but half roots and, and, and fauna just or flora, I should say, just kind of growing and its walls are broken up. It was just well, they, yeah, it, it was worthy. It, it was worthy. <laughs> yeah. And they used those environments to also tell the story. Yeah, exactly. It, uh, and Cave Johnson, man. Cave Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's so funny. There, there's a lot that is good about that game from a lot of different angles. Yeah, I kind of want to play through it again. And you mentioned the mod community. I actually never ended up checking out the mod community because I got you, the game right when it came too. out. Yeah, um, well, that's what I'm... I'm getting excited thinking that now I have a unique way to revisit this game. Right, yeah. I was about to say, like, when you said you want to play through it a second time, you know, unless you really want to see the story again, don't do that. Just play the individual puzzles because you can yeah. literally just play a new puzzle until you solve it, you know, constantly and still have new <laughs> yeah. content months later because there's right. just so much content out there that's created cool. by users. I yeah. feel like I, instead of watching a TV show... Like, uh, uh, as it airs, I just waited for every season to come out, and now I'm going to go and dive in. Sure. <laughs> yeah, actually, I checked out the, the mod community when it when the game first came out. There wasn't a lot, yeah, but I, think I, I, imagine, have... I imagine these days, I, I definitely got to go back and revisit Yeah, that. exactly. I may have taken a glance at it right when it came out, and it left a lot to be desired, um, naturally. But, yeah, I f- kind of forgot about it as I moved on to other games, so... So, um, you know, from a, now that you've got a significant amount of game designs under your belt or, you know, a lot of experience as a game designer, is there a, any game that, that really, from a game design perspective, has really impressed you? Like, Other than Portal 2, of course. Hmm. I typically am impressed by games that kind of, how should I put this? As a whole package? Yeah, as the whole package, the way they, they're able to, to to come up with one concept and then use that throughout the game in, in new and interesting ways. Sure. Um, you brought up Braid as an inspiration to uh, the bridge, and I guess I'll bring up Braid as my answer to this question. Just the way Braid's able to take you know time and make you really think about it in a ton of different ways, but all of which are, are very unique to one another, and center all of the, the, the puzzles and gameplay around that. I think it does it very well. Yeah, uh, that's what I, you know, one thing I really liked about Braid, when I first saw the game, I um, I was like, oh, neat, you can go back in time, and that kind of solves the problem of you can make kind of a difficult platformer puzzle that's not frustrating every time you die and have to go through it again. It kind of lets you just, oh, I made a mistake, I can rewind it and then try again. And I was like, oh, that's really neat, but then as I progressed through the game, there were so many other mechanics that, that interacted with that rewind mechanic. Right. That that were just super cool, and I, I was really impressed by that. Yeah, it's kind of taking various objects in the game and saying, okay, so this one is, you know, affected by time in the way you know, but what happens if we take some things that are affected by our version of time, and then it forces you to think about that, and it forces you to interact with these objects in that way, and by it forces you to overcome that kind of logical gap that you're not used to. Kind of, I guess, uh, the way I did that in the bridge as well and made you kind of forget how gravity worked after you finished playing it. I think Braid sure. does it with, I think Braid sort of does that with time and, and gets you imagining, well, what if, what if I could go back in time and take an object with me? How would that affect the world? Right, yeah. And, and then there's also, you know, there are parts where parts of the map move depending on where you are, essentially your position along an X. Yeah. X, what's the word I'm looking for? Coordinate? Axis? Axis, yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah, and then there was like the shadow, almost like a time trial, you know, shadow, but you kind of have to have it do this, you know, do something. And it, I don't know, just the way, all the different ways that they came up with puzzles in that game was really, you really have to think about it. And every new world cr- comes with a new way to look at it. So every world felt new and interesting. And Yeah. Has the uh, developer of Braid worked on anything since? Has anything else come out, or is he's, there uh, he's currently working on a uh, a game called The Witness? It's kind of it's another puzzle game. It's it's structured way differently. It's kind of like an open world exploring a deserted island kind of. Oh, okay. I, I don't know if it's deserted actually, but sure. exploring some island and uh, basically it's kind of about solving mazes, but. 
when I say, oh, solving mazes, you think of like the back of a cereal box and are kind of uninterested by it. But it's actually kind of focused around like Hamiltonian paths, um, which are mazes with restrictions, which really get your your mind thinking in a very interesting way. And so um, nice. I'm not I'm sure the game has a ton of depth beyond that, um, just sure. in terms of the puzzles. So I'm really excited to, to play that one once it comes out. Yeah, I actually hadn't heard of that, but I am excited. I actually, re- about a few weeks ago, I, I replayed through Braid again just because I wanted to. <laughs> You've played it twice, and I haven't played it once. Yeah, Dan, you gotta get I on I played that. it a little. I think I played a demo uh, on the Xbox uh, right, right around when it first came out, and I liked it for sure. Yeah. That right. one in Limbo, I think I wanted to play those both, and I never did. Braid's just, it's really worth it to play through it because, uh, like I mentioned before, each world comes with a new mechanic and a new way to look at it, and it never gets stale because you're always, yeah. they're always twisting the way things sure. work. That's really cool. Okay, I mean, we, we talked about Braid, uh, which the bridge was influenced by. Ty, you're currently working on a puzzle game, a traditional puzzle game called Tumblestone. Yes. Uh, we, uh, the Shark Tank group, played it a little bit at the Seattle Retro Game Expo, and, and I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, it, it clearly had sort of a, maybe a Tetris attack kind of feel to it. Absolutely. So are, are you a fan of, of puzzle games as well? I am, um, and that kind of, you know, casual, uh, as much as Tetris is a puzzle kind of style, yes, absolutely. Um, I play those kind of games all the time, especially uh, Tetris Attack. And uh, and I actually play Hexic 2 a lot, which is kind of similar. You're affecting your other your player by doing kind of match three style things. Sure. For the people who are for the audience who aren't familiar with Tumblestone, how would you describe the game? It's a uh, a new take on match three. It kind of throws away a lot of the tropes that uh, you associate with match three, like um, like in Bejeweled or Candy Crush, when you connect three blocks at the bottom, like everything falls in randomly and you score a bunch of random points and a bunch of the board gets destroyed. Uh, it throws that away because Tumblestone's kind of about really deterministically thinking about what you're doing. Like every single thing that happens in the game is entirely your doing, whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing. If it's bad, you caused it. If it's good, you caused it. For sure. Let's see. Another thing is like match three games. It's kind of some match three games, especially going back to Bejeweled or Candy Crush, it's kind of like a, you know, almost hidden object where you have to scan through a large board of uh, colors and find three that happen to be matched. At Tumblestone, there's only five options at any time, and so you don't really have to do that. Um, it's it's a lot more about thinking ahead, thinking several steps ahead, and planning out the right order of, of blocks to remove from the board uh, yeah. so that you always have this set of three. Um, and it sounds really simple, because basically the game is just remove three blocks at a time, like a blue, 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 yellow, 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 etc. <laughs> um, and, and when I tell people uh, that's it, they're like, oh, that sounds super simple. Of course I'm going to pick this up, but it actually has so much depth beyond that because it's yeah. all about making sure you have that three to, to pair up every single time. And there are various consequences depending on the game type if you don't. Um, and so basically the, the complexity comes in with how the uh, the board is, uh, how the blocks on the board are, are shuffled together and how you have to, to you know get through that by thinking uh, several steps in advance. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, at the expo, we played two different modes. One of them is like Tetris Attack, you know, where you're trying to clear your side of the board while simultaneously trying to screw over the other players. And then the other one was like a puzzle mode where you each get a unique puzzle and you have first one to solve their puzzle wins. What what other modes are there going to be in the game? Um, there's a, a lot of uh, single player modes as well. Those are the two of the multiplayers. Yeah. Um, so we have the single player mo- puzzle mode, which uh, the player g- is given a lot of challenges around, like uh, kind of like a meta game style, like do this certain thing in this different mode and this different different difficulty or whatever. Uh, we have like a marathon mode where it's it's a lot more. Uh, it's kind of like the marathon modes in other games like that, where it's kind of casual. It's it's meant to take you know fifteen twenty minutes where you just kind of relax and, and smash blocks in a certain way. But it's got uh, different props that get thrown into the board just to you know interfere with you and make things interesting. We also have a uh, a heartbeat mode, which is is the most analogous to Tetris. It's like rows are constantly added and you just need to keep up with the timer and compete for a high score. It's probably one of my favorites just because it's, it's, you know, so simple, but so fast paced. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, that, you know, when you just describe the game to somebody that they might think that it sounds really simple, but when mm-hmm. they actually play it, there's a lot more going on. I actually had that experience when I was standing there watching people play it. And I thought, oh, this is just a, you know, a match three versus puzzle game like i mean not to say that i thought that it didn't look fun but i just thought like oh okay i've played games just like this before and i sat down and picked up the controller and it was only at that point that i realized 
really how it all kind of comes together, especially the mechanic where you have to match the three, and if you start mm -hmm. attempting to match the three, but then you realize you can't, and you have to shoot, you know, the color somewhere else and not make a match, that you kind of, uh, uh, you, you yourself get penalized. That, to me, was very unique because I have never seen a mechanic like that before, where failing to make the match actually penalizes you. Yeah, definitely. Um... And so, yeah, t like you said, Tumblestone is, it, it's like those other games, but it's, it's definitely got its own concept that's super unique and you don't actually realize it until playing it. Um, a lot of, a lot of people just like you, you know, look at it being played and it's like, oh, you know, I think I've played this before. And almost everyone thinks that they've played it before because, you know, other games have been all been so similar to one another that looked like it. Sure. Tumblestone looks like those games, but it isn't by no means similar to those games in that regard. Yeah, uh, I agree. That's kind of, yeah, my, one of my problems is that how do I, you know, convey that to people who, uh, you're gonna watch, you know, watch the trailer on Steam or whatever. And be like, yep, I've played this before. Why should I buy it? I, I oh. guess you'll just have to have like overlay text that says, <laughs> "Seriously, you have to try it. It's different." Yeah, yeah. we're gonna have a demo. <laughs> like, seriously, try the demo. Just right. Yeah, that yeah. I was gonna say a demo. Demo is key for this game because, Absolutely. like Dane said, when I first saw it, I was like, "Oh, okay, it's it's one of these games." And then picking it up and playing it, I was like, oh my god, I can't put it down. It was just, a, it was a lot of fun. To me, it almost felt like like Tetris meets Bust a Move. Yeah, where a you're, Yeah, because you're shooting straight up. You're from the shooting bottom. up from the bottom, and they're blocks kind of like Tetris. And I like the, the characters, too. The little unique characters that represent each player. Uh, they I thought that a nice was a, touch. That was a nice touch, exactly. Yeah, so yeah I really like the art. It seems really... It's stylized. Happy. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's, yeah the same, it it's the same artist from the bridge. I think he uh, he got tired of drawing black and white, like surrealist, somber kind of art. And sure. Yeah. Make colorful, happy art. Yeah. It actually really surprises me because those are su those are two completely different styles. Yeah. Everyone's uh, saying that too because like it's it's also two completely different styles of gameplay between this and yeah. the bridge. And so I think. Mario and I, we both worked on the bridge for about three years. You know, after mm -hmm. finishing, we were like, all right, let's both make something completely opposite because we were so tired of working on that game. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that. And that's, you know, I was about to say, that's the sign of a good artist uh, to be able to, to really uh, excel at two completely different styles. But honestly, you bring up a good point. That's also the sign of a good game designer to be able to design two completely different types of games, especially back to back like that, as opposed to having your sort of career of what you're known for and then deciding to do something differently to, mm -hmm. to make this choice now uh, and, and to make what, as far as I can tell, are two really good games, but two very different games is admirable. So um, on that point, is there uh, have you ever had any plans for maybe a successor to the bridge, a spiritual successor or an actual successor? <sighs> no. Actually, no. I, I I do want to branch out my design style, and Mario wants to branch out his art style. I want to make games that certainly make you think similarly and have a similar type of immersion and atmosphere, but not necessarily one that's around Escher or Gravity Rotation or Black and White. Never will again will we make another Black and White game. <laughs> uh, it's actually it's actually super difficult to make a Black and White game. Yeah, I can imagine, especially because you, you know, you have the you have the black pieces and the white pieces and they're like polar opposites and that makes sense. But then you kind of brought in the shimmery pieces. And I, when I first encountered that, I didn't really know what it was. It would have been a lot easier to convey that it's unique had you been able to use colors. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Uh, and also speaking of making different types of games, I noticed actually that you have also designed sort of a tabletop style game. I think it's called Off of You. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and I, I thought that was pretty cool. We're pretty big tabletop fans, Tim, a lot more so than I. I mean, I'm staring at our enormous collection that we have here. They're a ridiculous collection. Yeah, I'm pretty sure only half on. of these games have actually been played. No, we, <laughs> I've played more than half, and it's not that big. It's it's pretty large. 75 um, games, something like that. <laughs> uh, uh, so I thought it'd be fun to talk about uh, Off of You a little bit, and as well as, as tabletop games and designing tabletop games in general. Why don't you uh, um, kind of describe Off of You first? Sure. Well, uh, Off of You was kind of, I, I want to say I've been working on it for, for 10 years, but that makes it sound like it's been consecutive. Sure, um, it's, sure, it's, yeah. kind, it's kind of a, a blend of a bunch of tabletop games that I like and I like to play with my friends and family like mm -hmm. uh, Uno and uh, Scrabble. Yeah, um, for sure. Kind Classics of, that are yeah, also like, kind of easy to play with a large age range of people. Sure. Um, that and kind of kind of with mechanics of Rummy or, I don't want to say poker, but kind of you know similar style sequences and stuff. Okay. Um, it's kind of like if you took all that and put it in a blender. Um, and to, <laughs> basically, what I did is was I kind of just organically started mixing these games together for fun because I'm a game designer. And that's what I do. And sure. um, 
I, I started, you know, making up rules and I took my favorite parts of all of these games and threw out all of my least favorite parts of all of these games and put them together in the, uh, <laughs> over the course of, you know, playing once every two or three months over the course of years, it turned into off of you. And then I, yeah, and then I submitted it to Indicate. It was a finalist and that was pretty cool. I never actually had any plans of, of producing at retail or anything like that, because unlike making a video game, producing something physical is actually kind of expensive. <laughs> yeah, uh, very expensive. Absolutely. I actually have a prototype of a card game that I've designed and just looking at like, because I want high quality cards that feel good and have cool art and everything. But mm -hmm. I mean, even just cards can be expensive as hell. Yeah. When you think about how many you need to print and... Yeah, a, a close friend of mine who I used to work with at Nintendo actually has uh, finished designing and completely printing his own game. And he's been having it play tested at various conventions and whatnot over the last few years. I think he's doing his fourth attempt at a Kickstarter campaign for it. Fourth wow. attempt. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it just... It, it, Seems Four like times it's, the charm. <laughs> it seems like it's been a struggle for him to, to get it funded. Uh, and it looks really cool. I mean, he has very high quality art. Uh, the sure. mechanics seem fun. I haven't had the chance to sit down and play it, but a game that, that looks really appealing, in my opinion, is still not garnishing enough attention to actually be funded. And so right. I, I don't, I don't think I would ever do a, a Kickstarter for it or anything like that. Um, honestly, sure. I might not ever make it uh, physical, but I have considered making it a uh, just a, a quick digital game because it, sure. wouldn't take, it wouldn't take me and Mario more than a couple of months to, to put it together, probably. Yeah, that'd be really cool, and that seems to be a trend these days is making digital versions of tabletop games. I, for one, have... There's a tabletop game that I really enjoy called Eclipse, and it's this big, sprawling, you know, empire-building space opera almost. It's not really a space opera, because I guess it's drier than a space opera. But anyway, I've played, I played it over and over and over on my girlfriend's iPad, but I've only played it a few times actually on the board, just because it's so much easier. There's no cleanup, it's just, you know, yeah. you don't have to remember the rules because yeah, the game it, remembers them for you. It, it, yeah. It, yeah, like I've been uh, um, starting to get into Magic the Gathering for the first time, which might sound weird to a lot of people, because... <laughs> it's it's been around and it's been so big but uh i i would thought to myself you know maybe if i start trying the online client that that would be a, a, an easy way for me to kind of get get used to some of the cards and mechanics and that sort of thing but what i'm constantly being told is that because the online mechanic does everything for you you know it flips your what's it called when you when you tilt the card tap. to the side and you tap it taps your cards for you it takes count of your your life and it just does so many different things for you that actually when people who primarily play it online go to tournaments they perform less simply because they have a hard time keeping up with all of the different things you have to take keep sure, track yeah. of with your physical cards and, and counters and that sort of thing. But you're right. I mean, every time we sit down and play a really complex board game, I think to myself, I wish this was a digital version. Yeah, it, just it definitely so depends easier. on the game. <laughs> I yeah. think I think off of you would definitely be a lot easier to play digitally because the game kind of often involves a lot of like manual manipulation of, of things on the board, uh, which you can just do with one or two clicks on, on a digital version, theoretically. Right. Yeah. I haven't yeah, actually I made it. That. Yeah, well, I mean, I looked at the picture that uh, uh, was on your website, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it, yeah, it looks like you the the... The holder for your pieces looks kind of like the the one from Scrabble, except it's like five times over, or at least in in, in the picture. I don't know if if it's an actual if you actually have like. A I, I totally version. just stole the holder from some domino set. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and then there's there's just a number of different colored pieces, and 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 you really d did a good job kind of showing the different sequences you can make because like each line is pretty much a different type of sequence. So one is like four, uh, four, five, six, seven. One is the same number three times over. So like mm -hmm. six, six, six. And yeah, I thought that was pretty clever. So um, you mentioned uh, off of you was inspired by a lot of the classics like Uno mm -hmm. and Scrabble and such. Are there any newer tabletop games that you've been really enjoyed or been into? Like Settlers of Catan or something like that. Yeah, I love Settlers. Is that a new game? I have no idea uh, when, that, when that well, came out. 1997, well, I, guess, I think, I guess is when, when it came out. I, I guess I, I wasn't thinking of it more like new as in like super modern, but I think just like something that is more more than than Monopoly. I guess Settlers is like the Monopoly of the, of yeah, the higher... Of, of Euro what games. What would you call it? Euro <laughs> games? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, um, well... You know, the more complex tabletop right, games, I, I guess. I love Magic the Gathering, too. It's, oh, okay. Have nice. You, have you played Hearthstone, the... I haven't. I've, that's another one, just like the new Zelda game that I've been really wanting to play. Um, yeah, like, what, what I'll say about Hearthstone is that if you even have a little bit of time in the day where you just want to sit down and relax or, or, you know, just the time you're giving yourself between working on things, Hearthstone is really good for that. It's super easy because you can just play a real quick 10 minute match and then go back to whatever you're doing. Yeah, and 10 oh. minutes is a long match. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. 
And if you're a fan of Blizzard games at all, if you're Absolutely. a fan of, especially, particularly the Warcraft universe, if you're if you're investing in the Warcraft universe, too much time in WoW. Oh there yeah, dude. dude. Oh man, don't even that, get me started. My, my <laughs> least favorite part of Hearthstone was the fact that even though I have not played WoW and I've been staying away from WoW purposefully for like mm-hmm. one or two years, Hearthstone was giving me really hardcore nostalgia for WoW. Yeah, right. yeah. That's probably <laughs> the, that's probably their plan all along is to is to make you join drink for some WoW. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. And I mean, my my history with Blizzard and specifically Warcraft goes back to me picking up Warcraft two back in 1994 or whatever and and i've been a real-time strategy gamer and a huge warcraft fan since just the the tutorial itself is so full of just the warcraft goofiness that it just yeah the, the, <laughs> just just the tutorial i was like this is so much fun. yeah it was a really <laughs> clever way to show you how the game is played but also have characters that are actually from the warcraft series kind of bantering back and forth and it's, it's pretty cool, and it's free to play, and honestly, uh, uh, in my experience with it, I've found... I made the decision to spend some money on packs, but I think I've spent $20 total on the game and have <laughs> probably played it for way too many hours. Yeah. Uh, so you can actually play it free to play and just use the gold that you earn just by playing it uh, normally to, to buy more cards and that yeah. sort of thing. And if you do research, there's actually competitive decks that are made out of... Completely free cards. Completely cards that, that you come with the game, essentially. Yeah. Hmm. But I'm sure, uh, since you're a fan of Magic, I'm, I'm, you're probably familiar with decks that are, are crafted specifically to be a combination of economical, but still really powerful. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, so this game has, has a lot of that too. However, uh, compared to Magic, it really simplifies a lot of things, but it can also be more complex with certain things. Because it's digital only, obviously, there will never be a physical version, and they don't have to design it with a physical version in mind. So there are right. certain things that it does that just wouldn't work exactly, uh, yeah, in that's... a physical game, but still seems so simple because it just, it just kind of like happens, and you are familiar with the mechanic, you know? Like, I, I want to give an example uh, well, there's like you can mind. there's like things that completely mirror a card or create two copies of something or you sit yeah. Well, the things that you that could do in magic but, is like you'll have your your just well, yeah. There's like tokens and stuff, yeah. but for example, there's one there's this one legendary. Um, it's it's Isera, the the Emerald dra- Dragon. Yeah. Um, the aspect of Earth or whatever, uh, or aspect of the Emerald Dream rather, mm-hmm. and. When she's in play at the end of your turn, you get to draw a card from a special deck called the Dream Deck, yeah. and it's it's five different cards, I think. And, and they're just, all ridiculous. You have powerful. To, they're all crazy. But the thing is, it, you know, you could do that in a physical version, but it would just be such a pain to have this separate deck sitting just next to you just for that, that one use. card that you Plus, may or may not. What that would do mm-hmm. is that would if somebody didn't even know what you had in your deck, you had that little pile of dream cards. Yeah, exactly. Next to you, they it's, would know you had. You'd have to like, in your deck. yeah, you have to keep it in your back pocket you know <laughs> yeah so, the, so uh, yeah that's actually a pretty good example yeah so there's there's lots of things that that could be done in physical versions but are just so much simpler in a digital version sure yeah i, I didn't think that i would get as into hearthstone as i did but i like it a lot uh, just because i like games that can be really easily played with a casual mind- mindset but have the potential to also you know be more than that you know you can you can play it if you don't really have a lot of time uh, or you don't want to devote too much thought to it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you can get into it on a more competitive and, and, you know, I guess serious level. Yeah, the thing about the thing about the competitive scene for Hearthstone is that the games are so quick. The the pro players that are out there, the people who are doing this, you know, at the highest level, they can play a hundred games in a day. So the metagame just shifts so quickly because yeah. like People will be able to work out a deck in two days because they're able to just nonstop play the game, you know? Yeah. But another cool thing about it is that Blizzard's able to balance in a unique way by just changing a card, tuning its stats or whatever, and just patching it, right? So they don't have to, like, do a reprinting of a card if it was a physical deck. Right. Yeah. Well, Magic's, Magic's pretty much committed to it. Yeah, like, exactly. Once they print something... Like... Yeah, well, basically, yeah, if they decide that that kind of breaks the game, they have to ban the card, and it's gone, as opposed to being able to rewrite it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that's kind of a cool look at the difference between a physical game and a, and a digital game. But I am trying to get into Magic. I, I, have some, I have some friends who are really into it, and when they found out that I don't play, they were like, you have to come with us when we go drafting, and <laughs> come over, and I've got a really basic deck you can use. I'll teach you how to play, and... Yeah, Magic's so. a game that can get expensive if you get to exactly. Too much. That's what I keep saying to people. Is <laughs> yeah, like, I'm t- what, I think I'm tumbling down a rabbit hole here. That's what holds me back is the <laughs> monetary investment. Yeah, apparently one of my coworkers owns his own card shop. 
Oh. And I, I was like, what? Why do you, why do you work here? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I told him that I would, I would hit him up if I did tumble down the rabbit hole just for some, some assistance in building decks and whatnot. But anyway. So the way we end um, these podcasts, Tyler. Ty, Ty, damn it, Ty, I did, did it. did it. I did it. He almost made it through the whole thing. Is, is Ty short for something? Nope. Just nope, Ty. Just Ty, okay. Just like, Ty. All right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the, the way that we end these podcasts, Ty, is that we ask the guest a question that our previous guest came up with, and then we task you with coming up with a question for our next guest. And it may or may not be related to gaming. Some of them have been, some of them haven't. But the question for you that our previous guest came up with was, if you could take a boss out of one game and put it into another, what boss would it be and what game would you put it into? Oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to think of bosses you know, that I particularly have enjoyed. Sure, but bosses are really know. cool mechanics. Sure, but then I'm trying to think of like new, <laughs> <laughs> new ways to implement that boss. Um, yeah. Okay, I, I got one. I got it. So oh, nice. I remember, I remember the boss in Ocarina of Time. Yeah. Uh, Ganondorf. Uh, it's like you gotta, you gotta use like your uh, your special sword of light or whatever to to bounce these these balls of energy off of off of your sword and you kind of play mm-hmm. tennis with them yeah it'd be cool if you didn't have a sword and you had a portal gun and you had to you know, do that somehow and so oh but i put gandorf in portal so kind of like glados at the end of the original portal but it would be more moving around and stuff yeah 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 it's know, GLaDOS it is all yeah no I mean, well it, it yeah I could, I, I could see it working yeah. in, in a way where you had to be particularly reflexive to, to yeah. make sure yeah yeah, that could be really cool. It's an interesting crossover. That's the best yeah. answer I've got for such a hard question. That's sure. okay. No, that's that's suitable. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that'd be neat because, you know, it, it, if the boss, they projected that they were about to attack, but they were also, they were stationary while they do that, so you would have to kind of set up the portals ahead of time and then mm-hmm. kind of coax them into getting in the right spot and then attacking. Yeah. And then being able to dodge the attack. Yeah, that'd be that'd be fun. Yeah. So, so, uh, so much did you go make them out of it. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, just mod Ganondorf uh, uh, into into Portal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no problem. <laughs> um, cool. So, would you be able to come up with a, a question? And it could be anything. Doesn't necessarily have to be related to games. Uh, but I mean, as a game designer, I'm sure it might be easy or fun to come up with a game design related question. Since I guess that yeah. previous question was also by a game designer. Past past questions that we've gotten are like, uh, what's a What's an art style of games that has really stood out to you? Another one that's not related to gaming was what was your favorite year or moment or time of your life that you enjoyed the most? Another one was um, drawn a blank. <laughs> <laughs> there were a few others. Oh yeah, the TV show, something about TV shows. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it was it was it, what TV series do you think got canceled too early or uh, another, jumped the shark? Yeah, another one off. was uh, what filmmaker has always done you has right? Never let you down. Yeah. Do, do I know who the person who will be answering it is? I mean, yeah, uh, we might the as next say. guess is going to be Logan. I think it's Feath. Oh, interesting. Okay. All right. So my my question for Logan then is, if you were to take the core mechanic of two puzzle platformers. By core mechanic, I mean you know the bridge, you rotate gravity, and mm-hmm. right, you time backtrack and stuff. Sure. If sure. you if you were to put two or more puzzle platformers in a blender, what two would you use for for a mechanic that turns out pretty well? He would say his fourth wall manipulation from the fourth wall, or I don't know exactly what you call that. Um, <laughs> well, what's that mixed with? Uh, oh, yeah, I guess that's true. I, whatever he's doing for his new game. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's, that would be interesting. That's I'd say that that would be an invalid answer to so, choose your own mechanics. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah let's, let's, let's say that he can't use... Yeah, uh, he can't use He his can't own. use perspective or he can't use uh, fourth wall. Oh, that's, yeah, perspective, I forgot. Well, what our pre- past guests have done is they've also answered the question that they came up with. So, what mm-hmm. would your answer to that question be? Let's see. I would. I would use. You can't use uh, uh, gravity manipulation. No, I won't. I won't. I was actually thinking uh, braid and portal because I can imagine mechanics that mix together such that you have portals, much like in braid, where you have objects that you know have their own kind of time dimension you know they travel with you through time i was thinking you could apply that to portals as well i mean if you've ever played the flash game like 2d portal they're like 2d side scrolling versions of it right yeah 
where you have portals like that. So like you place a portal, it sticks through time or another portal doesn't stick in time. You go back and it goes back through one of those portals and you replace it. Then you oh, go right man. forward through time. And you have to kind of juggle <laughs> yeah. it, uh, in that kind of sense. And I think yeah. that could be interesting. Creating bubbles in different points of time that your portals are connected to where it adds not just uh, space manipulation, but time manipulation. Yeah. That's really cool. I yeah, could, I, could, I could totally see a situation where you like, you know, you do the standard portal thing where you put a portal on a, a diagonal and then you jump far so it shoots you out, you know, mm-hmm. and then you shoot out and then you launch a portal and you suck yourself back in time because you needed to shoot out some distance to get past something to get a portal over there. But <laughs> but it's one of the portals that sticks in time. So you go back in time and that portal stays over there. Yeah, I could totally see that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that could be very interesting. That's really cool. That's a that's a great answer. Um, okay. We've got Ty's game idea. We can get off the call now and make start making that game. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> make millions. <laughs> yeah, I'll get into all that uh, indie game money. Yeah, all, all the copious amounts of indie game money that are available for grabs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you have the uh, three years of, of effort to put into it, go for yeah. it. Yeah. No. Uh, well... Uh, maybe one day. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, uh, thank you so much, Ty, for, for joining us. It, it's really been a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it has. And uh, if people are interested in following you, uh, where can they find you online? Uh, well, my Twitter is uh, at I Make Indie Games. Nice. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's all, we've also got uh, TumblestoneGame.com. Cool. What about you personally? TyTaylor.info. Awesome. All oh. right. Okay, so this was uh, Dane and Tim with Shark Tank. And, oh, and that's shark with a C, by the way, uh, because, you know, shark with a K was taken for some reason. Yeah, I can't imagine why. <laughs> uh, thanks for listening to Name Your Game. Uh, we work on a lot of other projects here at sharktank.com. We're a nonprofit, volunteer-driven gaming and geek culture site based in Seattle. We do local convention coverage, Let's Plays, tabletop strategy, and uh, game reviews, among a bunch of other things. So please like and subscribe if you want to support us in our work. And you can leave feedback through comments on YouTube, directly on our site, or you can email us at nyg at sharktank.com. As we mentioned before, our next guest is going to be Logan Feith. So he uh, recently got a game kickstarted successfully. And yeah, we're looking forward to talking to him. And thanks again, Ty, for coming on. It's been a pleasure, a lot of fun. So uh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're no problem. really looking Take- forward to Tumblestone. And uh, yeah. You know, Maybe you could toss a review copy our way. Nudge, nudge. Anyway. <laughs> Absolutely, I will. Yeah, no, uh, uh, we, also sure. have a, we also have a series called Game Chums, which is a, a cooperative Let's Plays. So yeah, that, cooperative that, Let's that Plays. would actually be a yeah, fun one to play. That would be a perfect game for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, you thank you so much. Yeah, it was nice talking to you. Thanks.